So, so far, uh, you've gotten largely a view of the science from the inside, from inside the IPCC, uh, and so forth. I'm sorry, I need to. Um, and I want to sort of do something else, since, since I'm a historian, not a scientist, um, I wanted to give you sort of a, more of a picture of the political uh, discourse and environment in which issues like climate gate could, as they have, become a big deal. And so I want to sort of step back and present a little bit of uh, deliberation on two questions that I think are sort of important for this, uh, for thinking about this. And the first is, uh, how do we know we have global environmental problems like global warming? And secondly, what should the relationship be between our knowledge about problems, uh, knowledge about global environmental problems on the one hand and policy interventions on the other? And I think that you know we live in a time where the answers to these seem to many people to be obvious, right? Um, we know we have global environmental problems because the science tells us so. Uh, and the scientific consensus on the second question will lead to some sort of consensus on policy. Scientists will tell us what to do. Um, but actually, I think neither of these answers is obvious, um, and both make a number of assumptions about nature of scientific truth, the relationship between truth and policy that are really quite subtle. And so I want to sort of problematize them a little bit here, and I'll take them in reverse order. And I should say, uh, these thoughts are not entirely original to me. They come from a number of sociologists, uh, political scientists, uh, people like Steve Rayner, Dan Sarowitz, Roger Pilkey Jr., who you reminded me was a junior, not a senior, <laughs> um, uh, who have been writing about these, uh, these questions for some time. So the first, to the first point, um, I think that people in the press, in policy, writing from a whole range of perspectives, on the issue of climate change tend to propagate a set of erroneous assumptions about the proper relationship between science and policy. Uh, specifically, I think there's a prevalent sense that getting the issue of climate change right is necessary for making good policy on the issue, uh, and that it is possibly sufficient as well. Uh, the precise expression of this uh, varies quite a bit. Uh, for example, policymakers uh, from all points of the political spectrum often say things to the effect of, well, uh, policy needs to be based on the best available scientific evidence. Uh, we also see this, for example, when uh, business groups or various uh, NGOs come out and finally say, yes, you know, we agree that global warming is happening, it's man-made, uh, and we need to uh, do something, usually curb carbon emissions uh, and so forth. They usually say, well, you know, we have decided to do this now at this particular point uh, because the scientific consensus is such and such. Uh, it's gotten really good. Uh, we also see this, um, you know, for example, uh, conversely, uh, when people complain about uh, junk science corrupting the policy process, the idea that uh, bad science will lead to bad policy, uh, hence these recurrent uproars of the sort that climate gate uh, is. It's exactly one of these latest opportunities for political figures and commentators to make statements of this sort. Um, there's also the matter, I think, of faulty uh, historical analogies. Uh, a lot of thinking on how to structure uh, scientific and policy-making institutions for addressing climate change, especially on the global level, uh, has been based on, uh, it's been sort of inspired by the negotiation of the Montreal Protocol, uh, which entered force in 1989, and this phased out emissions of substances that deplete stratospheric ozone. Uh, retrospective accounts of this process tend to stress the role of scientific consensus, on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion, uh, and this convinced developed countries uh, that they should develop, uh, that they should agree to deep emissions cuts in what really was sort of a spectacular display of uh, enlightened self-interest and global cooperation. Of course, that wasn't quite what happened. A number of people have worked on this history, uh, but nonetheless, the image of the Montreal Protocol remains, I think, for many people uh, who believe that climate change is a serious issue who are involved in uh, the Framework Convention and Kyoto Protocol as well, uh, it's a model for how environmental agreements should be achieved. Um, but I believe that there's reason to believe this model, of course, between sci uh, the relationship between science policy isn't the right one, or even that it's the best of several possible ones. 
Um, I think back, for example, Roger Pielke has analyzed uh, the public, the sort of kerfuffle after the publication of Bjorn Lomborg's book uh, on uh, climate change back in 2001, The Skeptical Environmentalist. Uh, he sort of criticizes both the IPCC's science, uh, but also the policy framework that they've adopted uh, in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, Pilkey notes on some issues, for example, uh, forest policy and carbon sequestration. Uh, Lomborg and his critics disagreed completely on the science, but actually endorsed similar policy recommendations. And uh, you can find this throughout the history of science. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the American decision to create a nuclear weapons program was based on uh, totally wrong estimates of how practical it was to make nuclear weapons. But in, in, in sort of ex post facto, it looks like a brilliant policy move. Um, so there are lots of examples of, of this happening. And similarly, on other issues uh, such as policy regarding CO2 emissions, uh, going back to the Lomborg case, Lomborg and his critics agreed that the science was basically right, but they came to totally different policy conclusions. Um, and so, you know, once you sort of spell it out, agreement on the facts, disagreements on policy, uh, this is fairly obvious, I think, um, but it just sort of reflects the fact there's nothing either logically or sort of empirically uh, that would suggest that getting science right will result in a political consensus at all. Uh, further, I think we need to be aware, though, how convenient it is uh, for people to make and promulgate this assumption. Um, consider the politician who argues, right, that policy needs to be based on the best available scientific evidence, right? They usually do this in the context of asking for more money for climate science research while simultaneously doing absolutely nothing to uh, address the problem of global warming. Um, similarly, uh, you know, uh, if you look at business groups coming out in favor of some sort of, uh, you know, remedy to the problem of climate change, I think back to the spring of 2007, uh, a number of business groups came out in support of legislation uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it seems unlikely that the timing of their announcements was prompted by some uh, drastic narrowing of the confidence intervals on climate change findings and so forth. It seems more likely, for example, in 2007 that the 2006 midterm elections gave people the sense that something was going to happen on climate change, and so they better be at the table. Uh, so political will clearly preceded intellectual conversion, uh, yet I think it's inconvenient for these people to maintain the fiction that science and enlightened self-interest are what is driving them. Uh, for example, Goldman Sachs uh, potentially stands to make a lot of money off of carbon credit trading schemes, yet in all their pronouncements on climate change they say that it was the science that brought them to this point. Um, scientists also go along with this fiction, I think. Now, this model of the relationship between science and policy, I think, would be just fine uh, if it just provided a fig leaf for decisions that are ultimately reached on political grounds. Uh, but taken to its logical conclusion, this model of the science policy nexus has destructive consequences for both science and policy alike. Basically, if you, if you insist on a one-to-one -one relationship between science and policy, you're setting up a situation in which every policy dispute becomes scientific and where every scientific dispute becomes a political dispute. And this is very problematic for a number of obvious reasons. Um, in the consequences of this for policy, I think, are just really unfortunate. Uh, in the United States, uh, the discussion over climate change is really kind of, uh, you know, sort of morally impoverished, I think. It seeks to pin responsibility for decision making not on political leaders, uh, but on climate change experts and on the technical details of climate change science. It tangles up political discussions and arcane statistics about emissions targets and baselines, uh, Himalayan glaciers, uh, the proper parameterization of global circulation models, and so forth. And it, dispute, it distorts the fact that at bottom, climate change science, yes, is about climate change. Climate change policy is, yes, about climate change science. Uh, but it's also about ideas of fairness, justice, and what good life looks like. Uh, so it sort of blinds us to that fact. Um, if the model of the relationship between science and policy has been unfortunate for policy discussions, though, I think it's been totally disastrous for climate change science itself. Uh, fundamentally, it's created a situation in which a very high stakes political issue encompassing some really fundamental problems in the structure of the global economy has been transferred to the terrain of science. Questions of policy have become questions of scientific fact, 
And this, I think, has exposed science to pressures as an institution that it simply isn't meant to bear. And so to get at this point, I want to turn to the first question that I asked above, how do we know we have global environmental problems? And I said the glib answer to this question, right, is science tells us so. Um, I know that science was what first convinced me that global warming uh, is a problem. I was a sophomore <coughs> physics student and did Arrhenius's calculation of the impact of the doubling of CO2 uh, on uh, basically on global temperatures. Um, but, uh, you know, that was something you could do on the back of an envelope and you could convince yourself fairly quickly that this was in fact going on. Um, but with the idea that good science is necessary for good policy, the notion that science tells us so or that the science tells us so, as opposed to the statement that scientists tell us so, I think also makes a number of assumptions about the nature of science that seriously distort and hamper the debate over climate change. Um, in popular consciousness, uh, assumptions about science, uh, uh, that it's some sort of mechanized process perhaps, that outputs indubitable truths, or possibly our understanding of science suggests that it is a human activity with various desirable characteristics. Um, we can distinguish neatly between facts and values. Science is a process of organized skepticism. Uh, it arrives on consensus in matters of fact or perhaps the criteria to evaluate truth claims in science are independent of the people doing the truth telling. Um, the notion that there's something distinctive about the scientific methodology or perspective or process is also reinforced by the scientists themselves uh, who want to make us believe that they have some uh, unique access to truth. And science, if we believe such characterizations of it, is in, in many ways an anti-politics. Um, it holds out the possibility of an escape from politicking. But of course, as anybody who spent time in the world of science knows, this is an illusion and it's a dangerous one. Uh, scientists, if nothing else, have careers and reputations. Uh, in this regard, at least, they certainly are not disinterested in the results of their work. Um, and this, I hope, is not to suggest that the results that they discover aren't reliable or that they're useful truths or so forth. They certainly are. Uh, but it does help us better interpret what happened in the climate gate affair. Uh, the academic politics, formation of coalitions and cliques inside science, tactical maneuvering around publications, uh, messy procedures to deal with disputed results, and so forth. Um, these are all part and parcel of the inner workings of scientific enterprise, albeit ones that we usually are sort of carefully screened from our view. Um, and I think that if we, as members of the public, people looking from the outside into science, had a more realistic view of how science actually works as a social process, uh, we wouldn't be as shocked when things like climate gate do happen. And in fact, uh, far from detracting from the authority of science, I think that having a more realistic view of how science works will help us get over this shock. And indeed, yes, I think that future scandals surrounding climate change science are in fact inevitable. Um, there will always be mistakes in scientific reports. Um, these future scandals may not perfectly replicate the uh, events of last fall. Uh, for example, in the past, similar uh, sort of uh, kerfuffles and scandals have erupted around the IPCC uh, for, in a number of ways. Usually they've tended to sow distrust uh, of the panel, especially among constituencies in the developing world, um, rather than the US as they are starting to do now. Um, so more broadly, I might suggest answering the question, why do we think we have global environmental problems? Uh, not with because the science tells us so, that is inadequate in a world as diverse as the one we're currently living in. Uh, we really can't expect formal pronouncements of organized science to be the thing that will convince all of us in living in so many different nations on Earth that, that climate change is real and that human activities cause it. Um, so that's one thing I think I would like to leave open for discussion. Uh, finally, to bring things full circle, I think it might be helpful to rethink some commonly held assumptions that we have about the relationship between science and politics. The notion that getting the science right will lead to consensus on the correct policies is not only absurd, I think, it also atrophies our politics and it subjects scientific institutions to stress that they aren't meant to take. Uh, this sort of implosion of science and policy making, I think, in a number of ways accounts for the consternation that this climate gate event has caused in the media.
uh, in a climate of politics in which science uh, is, polit is policy and policy is science, then perhaps it's not unreasonable for people to think that minor scientific errors are evidence of fraud uh, and deception, and contentious scientific debate is evidence of some political conspiracy. Uh, but again, I want to leave the problem of imagining a better model for science policy interaction for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.